ending panels for this afternoon. We have several invited guests, and you can see the full uh, blurbs, the descriptions of each session at stchaz.edu slash democracy days. We have transgender today, and I think six invited guests, uh, along with our adjunct faculty member, Tracy Bono, that's at one o'clock, and then Afghanistan in focus, uh, the most uh, recently added session to the menu of, of sessions. And uh, of course, we've been watching the news and uh, tracking the progress and the end of the war and um, all of th that that entailed uh, very recently. So we've got a military veteran. We have uh, an Afghan uh, immigrant who's been in the United States for 29 years. And we have one of our economics faculty on that panel. So that's at 1 o'clock and 2.30. If you can make it, please do. Otherwise, let's welcome to the podium Chaz DeBoer. Thanks, guys. And uh, before, before I begin, I'd just like to ask for a round of applause for Michael Kelker. Professor Kelker has been putting this on for years, a tireless advocate. Uh, and, and we're hoping uh, now that, that he has uh, maybe freed up a little bit more of his time, we can get him to run for office uh, and, and really, really make some changes around here. So that's, that's Professor Kelker's Democracy Day. This is his thing. He puts this on. Uh, uh, just this is, this is why we have good people here. Uh, and this is one of the best people that we've got. Thanks for coming. Uh, I've got a paper here. Um, some remarks. I, I am really interested in some feedback here, hoping that it can generate not only some discussion, but maybe some critique too. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if this hangs together myself, uh, but we'll run it up the flagpole and see who salutes. So I'd like to open with a series of observations about working at a gas station. Um, mine was in the middle of Minneapolis. I worked the third shift, which is the overnight, uh, refilling donuts, mopping floors, and killing a lot of time. Strictly speaking, I was not an employee of the oil company that sold the gasoline. As with most gas stations, the attached convenience store is a separate legal entity. The money these stores make isn't in gasoline. It's in chips and beer and Coke and cigarettes. I sold so many cigarettes, from regulars coming in for five packs a day to the occasional request for Virginia Slim's menthol gold 120s. Uh, anybody? No. As you might expect, working behind the counter at a 24-hour convenience store comes with its share of security issues, but the biggest is cigarettes. We kept them under lock and key in the back, and after the place across the street got its license pulled for selling to underage customer, our manager had us checking everybody's ID. I once checked the ID of a police officer. He was not happy to be asked. I told him there was a camera behind me that my boss could look at, might make me lose my job. He was not amused. He did end up showing me the ID. Anyway, we had to check the money people used to pay for the cigarettes too. Everybody who uses cash pays with a 20. And there is a surprising number of counterfeit 20s floating around out there. As you probably know, it's not hard to spot a fake. You can hold the bill up to a strong light, or you can use a special pen to test it, but it does take an extra second or so, and when you're conducting so many quick transactions in one shift, it is a step that you are occasionally inclined to skip. This was Chris's situation. Guy came into his store in Minneapolis, asked him for cigarettes, paid with a 20. At first, Chris thought the bill looked a little off, but before it occurred to him to check it, the guy was out the door. Whatever. Could be the guy didn't even know it was a fake. Chris, like every other convenience store clerk in human history, was just hoping to get through his shift without any drama. But then he got to thinking about his manager's policy, which was to deduct the cost of the counterfeit money from the pay of the clerk who took it, Chris was also hoping to keep his job and keep his paycheck intact. So now he has a decision to make. For a moment, a moment, he thinks about just taking the hit to his paycheck. It was almost worth $20 to him not to have to make a big deal out of this. Almost. When he hears the story, Chris's manager tells him to go outside and ask the guy to come back into the store and pay for the cigarettes. Chris does so, and now this guy is faced 
with the decision. He refuses to go back into the store. So Chris's manager decides to call the police. They show up. The next thing Chris knows, there's a whole lot of noise. Chris looks outside. He would later say that he was feeling disbelief and guilt at the scene unfolding in front of him. He sees several people, all in the process of making a number of very serious decisions, including one of the arresting officers who decides not to move from where he is kneeling for the next eight minutes and 46 seconds. I'm going to talk today about where ethics comes from and where it's going. I'm not going to engage in historical analysis or political advocacy or social critique. Plenty of all three of those is available on request at other sessions this week. I am not a priest. I'm not a prophet. And I am not a poet. I am an ad man for philosophy. As it happens, I'm also a client. I use the stuff myself all the time. That's why it's important to clear up at the outset just what's not on offer here today. I don't have any secret hidden mysteries to share. I haven't cracked the code of the perfect life. I don't even have much interesting trivia to offer. All I hope to do is to present you with something like a filter for our thinking. Namely, the thinking we do about the awful and important parts of our lives in which we have to make decisions. Plato once observed that philosophical education is not so much a process of bringing new and amazing things into view. It's more like adjusting one's eyesight in order to see more clearly what's been there the whole time. I'm going to try to bring a few things into focus. In order to do so, I want to start by trying to diagnose our vision disorder. First, a basic and important truth about human beings. Beneath all our pretenses to scientific rationality, we are in our daily lives creatures of habit. This is no cutting edge insight. It is demonstrably well known even to the ancients. Our word ethical and this is going to be a repeat for a few of my ethics students that I see here in the room. Our word ethical comes from the ancient Greek ethos, which in the writings of Aristotle came to mean a person's moral orientation, the quality of her character. As any good English student at SCC can tell you, Aristotle mentions ethos as the first of three modes of persuasion. But unless we pay attention to exactly how this word was handed down to him in the first place, we risk a perilous misunderstanding, not only of Aristotle's idea of rhetorical ethos, but of the very roots of ethical thinking and behavior. What Aristotle certainly does not have in mind is that someone is persuasive because she's a sanctimonious nag, what in my family we would have called a do-gooder. No, Aristotle thinks a person's character is persuasive because we find her trustworthy reliable, constant as the North Star. In older sources, like Aeschylus and Homer, ethos, the parent word of ethos, denotes custom, how we do things around here. Habit. Thus understood, an ethical person is a person of good habits. This etymological connection is appropriate in that it is consistent not only with Aristotle's philosophy of moral character and action, that is his ethical theory, but also our own lives. When we got into our cars to drive to campus this morning, exactly none of us sat behind the wheel before turning the key and engaged in rational contemplation of whether we were going to drive on the left-hand side of the road or the right. Nobody thought before taking a seat in this auditorium whether maybe to stand on top of the tables instead or to greet the neighbor to your left or your right by punching them in the mouth. Nobody did that. From early childhood, our grown-up guardians attempt to build good habits in us. And these efforts are, for the most part, remarkably successful. We manage to live out our days in relative peace and comfort simply by running the program, so to speak. So far, so good. So what? Is the point that humans amount to nothing more than easily trained mammals genetically endowed with a manual dexterity to order takeout on their smartphones? That comes uncomfortably close to, but still just shy of, the whole truth. For one thing, it leaves unanswered the question of just what makes the good habits good. 
In other words, how did our parents know which ones to build in and which ones to leave out? And if we answer that their choices were influenced by their parents, we have on our hands what philosophers call a regress problem. We're unsatisfied with any explanation that implies that it's just turtles all the way down. Then there's also the matter of how we maintain those good habits. Even if we manage to determine the essential features of goodness and instill it in our children, what are they supposed to do once we send them off to school? To adapt an observation made by philosophers and first grade teachers alike, moral innocence is like strawberries. It's sweet, but it tends to spoil. Furthermore, even the best unreflective habits become useless to us in those moments like the ones confronting Chris and everybody else who happen to find themselves at the, at the corner of Chicago and 38th on the 25th of May last year. Let's go back to Aristotle. He opens one of his ethical treatises by raising the question of the nature of what's good, what we aim to accomplish. Aristotle reviews some of the more popular options like pleasure or honor or even wisdom. Again, though, how to decide. And if we can't decide about the nature of the good, how are we supposed to know how to make the right decisions? Well, wait a minute, says Aristotle. Let us not fail to notice, he says, that there is a difference between arguments from and those two first principles. This, he tells us, is the lesson that he learned from his teacher, Plato. Some lines of reasoning deduce particular truths from universal concepts, like using the kinetic theory of gases to tell how a certain quantity of radon is going to behave at room temperature, let's say. Whereas other lines of reasoning work in the opposite direction, grouping together individual cases in order to get a higher order idea of principles that apply to all of them. Like studying several kinds of mammals in order to be able to infer general truths about that class of vertebrate. So what does this have to do with how to make tough decisions? Aristotle is pointing out that if we're going to try to deduce answers from the nature of goodness itself, we're in for a slog. If we can't even establish the basic properties of goodness, then there's no way we'll all end up agreeing about what we're supposed to do in a given situation. But well, that's the wrong way to work the puzzle. After all, Aristotle remarks, you got to start with what you know. While many of us might not see the highest truths very clearly at all, real life does furnish us with plenty of instances of, all the, of, of, of what the good people have in common. And maybe if we attend to that, we'll be in a better position to figure out what we ought to do when the right move isn't so obvious. This is exactly the strategy that Aristotle adopts. Questions about ethical conduct, he observes, are like questions about physical health. It's the nature of life to be damaged by excess and defect, he says. But what counts as excessive for one person, in terms of diet or exercise, for example, might be just right for another. The key to a healthy life seems to be proportionality, balance, of nothing too much. This is sometimes labeled as the doctrine of the golden mean, but Aristotle didn't say golden mean. Aristotle said orthos logos, an expression that can be translated correct rule or right principle, but what literally means something closer to straight reckoning or the upright way. Now, as promising or at least intriguing as this may sound, it has to be admitted that by itself, stick to the correct rule is a pretty abstract piece of advice. Not much help in the moment of truth. What more can we know about how to navigate the rapids? A couple of years ago, Michael and Ashley were both in need of a fresh start. They hadn't met yet. Ashley had just divorced her first husband. She would remarry later that year, but she had already begun to find inspiration and a sense of purpose in a passionate online community. Michael was getting off the mat that year himself. No divorce, but plenty of humiliation. He spaced out briefly during a long day, and it ended up being one of his coworkers who let him know he had left his service weapon in the bathroom after having been on the force for 26 years. Michael had decided to join back in 1993, just one year before Ashley would decide to begin her career with the United States military. On the day they met, Michael was scheduled to work security at an event with a big crowd. He was just hoping to keep everyone safe and mayhem to a minimum. 
Ashley had decided to travel from across the country to get to that event. She was hoping to change the course of the country that she loved. As the day went on, Michael's work got increasingly tense, just as Ashley's day was getting more and more exciting. Both of them were getting caught up in the swirl of activity, and before they knew it, there they were face to face with only a pane of glass in between them. They were calling to each other simultaneously. Ashley cried out and decided to move forward toward Michael. The ball was now in his court. He decided, as he never had for the past 28 years of service, to aim and discharge his weapon. Ashley fell. Blood immediately starts pouring from her mouth. Her mother-in-law would later describe herself as numb. Michael would later say that although his life was turned upside down in that moment, he still believed he had saved lives. Ashley would die for her decisions. Michael would have to live with his. The idea that our decisions ought to be governed according to some principle of proper proportion and straight reckoning has been so profoundly compelling throughout the history of thought that one might almost be persuaded of its truth for no other reason. The devil, of course, is in the details. Though ultimately the progeny of ancient Logos, the modern conception of reason took shape over the, over the course of intervening centuries, having been influenced by Neoplatonic and Augustinian epistemology, as well as Islamic falsafa, shaped and systematized in scholastic metaphysical psychology, reconstituted as the Cartesian lumen naturale, and made slave to the passions by David Hume. So it was that by the turn of the 19th century, having culminated in the work of Immanuel Kant, the greatest of all modern philosophers, the Aristotelian Logos Orthos had been transformed into Praktische Vernunft, practical reason, the sole legislator of morality, operating entirely independent of personal desires and totally unpolluted by social custom. Kant contends that the only possible way for any action to be truly ethical is for it to be willed and performed purely out of a sense of duty, that is, without any regard to circumstances, even happiness. To his credit, Kant was the very first to recognize that such extreme asceticism renders pretty much all human activity amoral. In fact, Kant openly raises the possibility that no one has ever acted solely out of a sense of duty. To be sure, such veneration of shining moral purity lifts deliberative decision-making out of the realm of habit entirely. But Ashley and Michael and Chris and all the rest of us have to operate in the world as it is, with all its messy accidents. If reason really is so remote from real life, how can it furnish us with any actionable intelligence at all? It is on precisely this point that the 19th century philosopher Hegel seizes, arguing that the supposed purity of Kantian moral reasoning is, in fact, emptiness. Kant's idea of reason as a guide to conduct hangs on an analogy to the physical world. Kant argues that laws are the products of rational thinking, when reason is applied to the natural realm, we get natural laws. Think of Isaac Newton here. Just as Newton's formulation of, say, force as the product of mass and acceleration takes no account of what kind of material we're dealing with, the second law of motion applies equally to rocks as well as baseballs, moral laws, which are the product of rational thinking about human action, ignore particular distinctions that diversify us like location, financial status, age, race, gender, so on. Moral laws legislate universally. They apply to everybody. And necessarily, they admit of no exceptions. But Hegel observes that if we ignore all information about our actual living conditions, we have no way to determine what it is that our rational decision-making ought to be working toward. Light by itself doesn't enable us to see clearly. It has to be reflected by something in order for us to perceive colors and shapes. To make Hegel's point by way of an extreme and absurd example, a rule of conduct that says exterminate all human beings is not intrinsically irrational 
unless that is we also adopt the substantive premise that human life is worth preserving. On Hegel's account, Aristotle was right to, was on the right track to begin with. Moral reckoning has to be grounded in ethical truths to which we're committed prior to making the tough decisions. So back to square one. Not exactly. Consider what we've laid down so far. We build good habits in order to become good people. We know how to do this because we grew up around people who show us the way. Most of the time, this is enough, but sometimes our habits fail us. We get thrust into a situation that forces us out of ethical autopilot. When this happens, we find ourselves compelled by two very different kinds of feelings. A sense of hope and a sense of what's right. The hope may be elevated and far-reaching, like Ashley's hope to live in a nation restored to its ideals. On the other hand, the hope is often comparatively mundane. Chris just hoped to get through his shift unscathed. Either way, Aristotle was on to something. We're always aiming whatever we do at what we judge to be the best outcome for ourselves. Our sense of what's right also comes to us in different aspects. Mike felt a more or less direct sense of responsibility to defend those with whose protection he had been charged. Chris's case was something of the reverse. It may seem strange to us that he reports, and he really did, feeling guilty while watching the police end a man's life. But however misplaced this feeling may have been, it's clear that Chris's decision-making was imbued with a sense of what's right, a sense of how things ought to go. So it appears that Kant saw at least one thing clearly. We strive to meet a standard beyond ourselves. We feel a sense of duty to the moral law. The fact that we often fail to live up to its demands may be the most obvious indication of the moral law's objectivity. The hopes are mine, but the duty is everybody's. The problem before us lies in the tension between right and hope, a tension that erupts into conflict. Sometimes this conflict is realized by two different people, as it was in Mike and Ashley's situation. Sometimes it's realized through a person's own struggle with himself, as in Chris's case. This conflict, which is the essence of ethics itself, is quite literally a tragedy, if we understand the nature of tragedy to be moral contradiction. If Mike fails, the state is wrong and the nation is wronged. Through his service, he was protecting the rightful work of a rightful institution. If Ashley fails, the state is wronged and the nation is wronged. Through her service and her activism, she worked to realize the hopes of patriotism. Now, it's at this point that it might occur to us to try and relieve the tension by alleging bad faith of one side or the other. He wasn't really defending anything. He was just another unqualified government worker who doesn't care enough to do his job well. She wasn't really a patriot. She was just an attention-grabbing loudmouth who used fantasies and lies to cover over her own personal failures. There's no conflict here, no real conflict. There's just a winner and a loser. Sometimes the good guys win, sometimes we suffer a setback, but either way, we'll get them next time. This is a dodge, both epistemic and moral. It insists that one side is an illusion, that there's always only the one truth, that if ignorance and falsehood and malfeasance were obliterated, we would all see it just the one way. And it has to be pointed out that there are cynical manipulators with big mouths constantly dragging us through rivers of bullshit in order to realize some greedy little scheme. Yes, some people really do have small souls, but that doesn't make the conflict an illusion. In both of the cases we've been looking at, somebody actually got killed, Chris has to live in the world of his decision, and he would have to have do so even if he had made the opposite decision. $20 poorer, possibly jobless, and totally oblivious to his fateful avoidance of the alternate reality in which we all know the name of George Floyd. The conflict is real. The question it opens is, what are we going to do about it? Here it is relevant to point to another common property of the cases of Chris and Mike and Ashley. The catalyst of each moral conflict is nothing other than the product of the civil effort to resolve moral conflict. 
the law. Now, of course, many different particular laws inform each of these different conflicts. This presentation is not an exercise in positive legal analysis, and I would certainly not be the one to give it if it were. Nevertheless, I will be so bold as to venture from a philosophical standpoint to speak of the substance of the concept of law. In other words, what's behind the very idea of law? Law is the formal way human beings clear the way for human beings. Applied to nature, law clears the way for thinking, for figuring and understanding. It is the code of the regularity of phenomena. Applied to human life, law clears the way for action, for reckoning and reconciling. It is the shape of our social logic. In this latter sense, which of course is the sense that concerns us here, law is the articulation of universal command. It is the positive product of practical reason. The law binds us together and frees us for what we can become. That's the promise anyway. Now, in each of the cases we've considered, the law is personified. Someone actually represents it. The law is broken, a crime is committed, and the law is enforced. It is realized through physical coercion. This, it seems, is the chemical reaction of hope and right under sufficient heat and pressure. No doubt it has ever been just as it is now. Our human response to the persistence of the imminent collision of the exhortations of aims and duties is to try to locate the logos, to attempt a rational reconciliation of the ends of each to the good of all. Law suspends the tragedy of human life. It answers the questions raised by hope and duty. And without exception, the answer it gives breaks us apart. What is so remarkably ironic about each of the situations we've been looking at is how the law works to reveal its own limitation. Each of these conflicts involves an officer of the law, one charged with the actual execution and enforcement of legal commands. Now, one can take the position that the death of a human being in either or both situations is primarily or at least substantially the officer's fault meaning that the law was good, but the cop was bad. This implies that the law lacked sufficient agency. It wasn't really enacted. That's a limitation. Moreover, it's worth stopping to consider that in each case, the officer believed himself to be justified. It may well be that Michael Byrd and or Derek Chauvin killed wrongfully, but neither one of them is deranged. Bird went on national television and claimed that he believes he did his job and saved lives. Chauvin explained himself to a bystander in the moment, offering reasons for his behavior. He might be a murderer, but at no point during that 8 minutes and 46 seconds did he believe he was going to be convicted for it. In each case, the difference between the spirit of the law and the mentality of the enforcer exposes the limitation of each on the other hand, one could hold that the officers accurately discerned and correctly applied the law. Now, if justice is, as philosophers from Aristotle to Rawls have held, a first virtue, and if justice involves the realization of rational consequences, giving each his or her due, then if the law is the rational articulation of the social will, the end of the law must be justice. George Floyd may well have been guilty of passing a counterfeit 20, but surely it strains our sense of justice to suppose that death was a fitting punishment. The same has to be said of Ashley Babbitt, and it has to be said because saying it to those who acted in a similar way that she did. The QAnon shaman had to spend a little time in jail, but to the best of my knowledge, nobody involved in his conviction proposed executing him. If the law properly carried out falls short of justice, this is a limitation. So whether we fault the letter of the law or its application by its sworn officers, we concede the law to be finite. Really, though... Our observation of the law's limitations is no great breakthrough. During the immediate aftermath of each of these cases, our collective consciousness was awash with proposed solutions. 
better officer training, increased hiring of police, defunding of the police, decreased penalties for counterfeiting, clearer standards for treason, regulation of police restraint techniques, regulation of content on social media, a national reckoning on race, a national electoral recount. What all such measures have in common is that either they become legally sanctioned or they don't exist. That is, just as the ethical life of the individual human being is a matter of habits and decisions made in order to better approximate an ideal personal condition, so the ethical life of the law is constituted by promulgation, execution, judgment, and amendment for the sake of the just, best social condition. Now, as we've seen, Human ethical life is in part defined by the question of how to navigate the tension between self and society, individual hope, and collective right. This tension makes it difficult to discern how we ought to make decisions when push comes to shove. If part of the purpose of the law is to reflect the logos, to guide us rationally when our own habits might not, it is sobering indeed to consider that the law lives with the same question. What's supposed to guide legal changes? How can we know we're changing the law for the better? Turns out that the life of the law is simply a higher manifestation of the moral tragedy that characterizes human activity in general. Again, this is to be expected. Contradiction is the essence of ethical life. The law is just another aspect of this living contradiction. The very thing that was supposed to stabilize social life is, in fact, what keeps it moving. Once again, we seem to be right back where we started. It's enough to make one despair of ever resolving the conflicts of ethics once and for all. Indeed. But what if this problem is like one of those crossword clues with a question mark at the end of it? It's a problem that throws us off because we're looking at it the wrong way. We're approaching it under an assumption that is, in fact, untrue. To put it plainly, what if we're not supposed to eliminate contradiction? What if contradiction is the point? I want to go back to Hegel, the philosopher I mentioned earlier who critiqued Kant's moral theory for being too abstract, too removed from human life. Whatever the merits of Hegel's critique of Kant, it's worth mentioning the alternative Hegel presents. We know he's going to try to involve ideals of morality in the real world of human relationships. Hegel calls this involvement ethical life. And he finds its institutions to be full of contradictions at every turn. The family, unified by the very love that will end up facilitating its disillusion. Civil society, in which the subjective needs of each member strain against the objective rightful condition of the whole. The state, that spiritual undertaking in which an individual finds herself by losing herself. The I that is we, the we that is I. For Hegel, contradiction is like life itself, always in motion, striving to get itself beyond itself. As a matter of fact... Hegel goes a step further than that, declaring that, quote, something is alive only insofar as it contains contradiction within it, end quote. What? It's important to clarify that Hegel's idea of contradiction is not limited to the formal truth functional notion of a pair of statements with opposite truth values. For Hegel, real contradiction, that is not merely semantic but existential, involves opposite realities constituting a unity, a conflict that's essential to something's very being. A couple of examples might be helpful. During the process of an oak tree's germination, the seed leaf pushes itself out of the acorn, which eventually falls away entirely. The caterpillar becomes a chrysalis in order to make possible the butterfly who has to discard it. Mothers give their living energy to their children in order to enable those children to live independently of their mothers. 
In all living things, Hegel thinks, the success of the organism, as well as the success of the species, involves struggling against and overcoming the very thing that made its existence possible. That's natural contradiction. That's life. Ethical life is just another domain in which this same pattern is realized. We always find ourselves in some social condition whose ideals we work to vindicate by overcoming its present shape. Work that would be impossible without the present shape. The conflict that erupts out of the tensions constitutive of our social condition can be uncomfortable. It can be violent. It can even be deadly. But embracing the conflict as essential does not mean giving in to bloodlust or abandoning reason for a mindless war of all against all. Conflict is not chaos. Contradiction is not pandemonium. Every question begets a determinate answer, whether natural or ethical. Excuse me, an answer that will in its time fall apart into new questions. On this account, it is not the nature of life, whether natural or ethical, to answer our questions. Life is, rather, the questioning itself. Okay. Is this going anywhere? I mean, if life is defined by a process of contradiction and resolution and reformation, question and answer and question anew, are we, as the idealist believes, driving towards some final goal of the world? Or, as the existentialist would have it, is it all just a Sisyphean ordeal, rolling the rock up the hill? Is life ultimately rational or is it absurd? You knew we would get to this meaning of life stuff eventually. I'm a philosopher. For better or worse, today's advertisement takes us only to the threshold of this question. I will only pause to point out that we are at least in a position to observe a truth known from Plato to Martin Luther King Jr. Ultimately, every ethical theory rests on an eschatology. I did not arise today to speak of ultimate things. I will only express my heartfelt gratitude for having the good fortune to be delivering these remarks in the state of Missouri. Because Missouri is one big contradiction. It's a contradiction geographically. It is south and north. It is east and west. It is a contradiction historically, having emerged out of that enormous contradiction that is our national identity and doom, a contradiction through which we continue to work with every passing year. Best of all, Missouri's state motto is itself an explicit ethical contradiction. The ethical contradiction. Salus populi suprema lex esto. The will of the people shall be the supreme law. Every people is constituted by individual persons, each with his or her own aims and dreams. There is nevertheless a single highest law, and we are told, to our astonishment, that the single law grows out of the diverse array of its subjects. The many must somehow become the one. It is this task with which the motto charges us, this that it exhorts, esto, the future command, shall it be. I am suggesting that we consider this motto descriptive as well as normative. Might it not be the just best work of our democracy to find and follow the straight way through the contradiction? Thank you. I think Professor, if I'm lucky enough to get questions, Professor Kilker. Yes, I have a microphone and I can run around the room and bring the microphone to you if you have a question or a comment. Chaz, I, I have a question and I'm kind of coming up with it on the spot. It has to do with how we, how you, in your philosophical tradition, with that as your discipline and how we, as people who are grappling with philosophy, how can we frame the current situation? For instance, <clears throat> you mentioned Ashley Babbitt, and uh, that, of course, brings us back to January 6th of this year, which was a big date. We broke a long streak of peaceful transfers of power. And one of the things that 
we have to grapple with is we as a nation of people lack a common narrative about that day. And I'm seeing that phenomenon take place more and more, more intensely than ever, that we have these politicized views. For instance, uh, I thought most moral people would react similarly to the heinous death of George Floyd, but by the time that the Derek Chauvin trial came around, you had about half the country thinking it was mob justice to put this cop on trial, the man who killed him. Uh, we, what do you do philosophically when there's a lack of a common narrative? We don't even share the same assumptions of what we see. Thank you. One of the things that on the account we're pursuing here, it may be worth keeping in mind, is that the evidence setbacks to national unity, and it's interesting that, that, that the question brings up the peaceful transfer of power, the idea of the peaceful transfer of power. It, it can seem like these setbacks involve uh, a degraded national condition, that we're, that, we're, that we're moving backwards, we're moving in reverse from, from where we ought to be. Um, one of the things, so, so first of all, again, there's no prophecy in philosophy, and, and, and there is no like magical ability to conceive of where we are now in this, this big giant shape that's going to make sense of it all. There's a sense in which I, at least, am persuaded by another famous thing that the philosopher Hegel said, which is that the owl of Minerva only spreads its wings at dusk. That's a poetic expression, but what it means is philosophy can't really come to grips with things until they're in the past. Like, while we're in the moment, we're all just sort of muddling through. Having said that, there's always this other side to things. There is always the reality of the other side. One of the points that I wanted to emphasize about the reality of the conflict. And so I would compare this, the, the observation that we failed at the peaceful transfer of power on January 6th that seems like such a setback. And I don't want to deny uh, uh, that it was a bad thing. But it occurs to me that that's something like when President Obama, and he wasn't the first to point this out, and he would, he would admit that himself, but when President Obama pointed out to folks who wanted to say, I wish we could just get people to be quiet in the streets. Things were so much better, you know, back a half a century ago when we didn't have these sorts of protests in the streets. And President Obama, as so many others had already done, pointed out, well, were they better for everybody? Were they better for everybody? Or was it just better because we were, we were tuning out a big part of, of our national identity? Were, were we tuning, about, tu tuning out a number of our other citizens and residents? And the answer to that question is yes. That doesn't legitimate the means that people might use to express the disconnect. What it does suggest to us is that pessimism is not the only alternative here. Now, again, whether one's an idealist about these things or an existentialist, I leave that open to the question of these higher things that we only sort of got to the doorstep of and, and didn't walk over. But the question of, is, do we have to admit it's getting better, as the old song says? Or is it the case that we're just going round and round in a circle? That's a question about eschatology. That's a question about what we ultimately hope for. But logically speaking, even before we put anything in place of that eschatology, it's open to us to dispute the idea that every step in reverse is an indication of decline. It may be the case that progress is a matter of the back and forth contradiction that's driving forward. So I think not even a guarded optimism, but an openness to a certain hope would be, I think, what, what, what this line of thinking enjoins in us. Very interesting distinction. Thank you for that. Yeah, because I've been, I've been mulling over January 6th quite a bit. We all have. Who else has a question? Yes, just one moment. Oh, let's have everybody hear you. We need some elevator music while he's walking the mic over. How has researching these topics affected how you feel to your moral obligation? Me? How, how I research these topics affect my moral obligations? Yeah, because I know we all heard it in the news and everything, but you have had to do a lot of research in order to figure out what was going on on both sides of the account. Yeah, um, I don't, this is, I, I love this question because it's, it's admirably clear um, my research into these topics doesn't affect my moral obligations at all. 
My research into these topics doesn't affect my moral obligations anymore, and I, I go over this with, my, with, with, with people in my ethics class. It doesn't affect my moral obligations any more than taking an ethics class in college is going to make you a better person. Any more, and here's the parallel, and again, I'm stealing this one from another philosopher, any more, and consider this parallel, than taking a class in human physiology is going to make you a faster runner. Like, one is a theoretical investigation of what's going on, the other is practical. I think I was raised by good people. And so when I, when I encounter a moral situation, there's, there is a limited extent ever to which an understanding of the philosophical history of the discipline of ethics is helping me to understand my obligations in the moment. So again, the, the, the analogy there is one that seeks to distinguish theoretical understanding of something from practical understanding of something. It's the practical understanding that matters in the moment, and it's that that we hope we've been equipped with by our communities. I mean, there's, there's a certain extent to which understanding what's right and wrong is a matter of following the laws of the community that you're a part of most of the time. Trouble is, as I tried to indicate, from time to time, we trip over these situations, the death of George Floyd, January, January 6th, et cetera, and we could fill in the blanks with many, many more if we wanted to multiply examples, where it looks like those habits and even the laws fail us. In that case, don't fear the reaper. Don't, don't be afraid of the contradiction that's right in front of you. Face the contradiction. Carry your moral obligations out with the full knowledge that someone else is going to be doing the same thing against the position that you're adopting. It, it's cold comfort to say that let the chips fall where they may. It's slightly more insulating to say that in 99.9% .9 of cases, we don't have to do that. But an understanding of how we get to those situations, the sense in which those situations drive the project of our social unity, is what it is that philosophy has helped me come around on. But in terms of my individual moral obligations in a given situation, very little, very little, if any. I love the question. Thank you. Who else? Question or comment? Yes. Going alongside what she said with the morals, but how does your biases also coincide with your morals on subjects such as this one, that someone could have a bias towards police and others towards the people and towards the people who did the protest and who are against it? How does that go along with how philosophy is in total? So, so one of the things that, that is oldest and best about philosophy is how it is that it deals with that issue, which is so contemporarily relevant. And, and if I know nobody in this room would do this, but, but if we put the blinders on for five seconds, we could pretend that we invented that issue yesterday. This was an issue that the ancients themselves recognized. And, and here, I, I don't know if I've, if I've got anybody out there who's doing intro with me, but in intro to philosophy, we, we, we touch on this one. One of the basic observations that even the ancients made in philosophy is that it's, po it's impossible to have a meaningful disagreement with somebody unless you share premises, unless there are at least a couple of, of assumptions that we have in common. And so there's this method in philosophy that goes back literally thousands of years. It's not an exaggeration. There's this method that philosophers have called dialectic since it came up in the ancient Greek world. It's an art of discovering what premises we share. Nobody would bother to engage in that art unless we both came to the table understanding that we're biased to the hilt. There is no such thing as getting rid of our biases. That's an illusion. We would not be people if we didn't have biases. But to recognize them and to see how it is that they are firing the way that we're having the discussion is absolutely essential. And that's one on which I'm proud of the history of philosophy, that it gives us this technique that's been called dialectic, that's been worked over over the course of centuries for discovering shared premises. Like, what's the rock bottom that you and I share? And then what are the other, what are the other statements on which it turns out that we disagree? I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, my biases are influencing this disagreement. Where can we start together and then start unpacking the other parts where I come to realize, oh, that was just my point of view on things. That wasn't necessarily the substance in and of itself. And you as a partner in the discussion will come to realize the same thing. So the art of philosophy has enabled us for thousands of years to deal with precisely that problem. Yes, that was an excellent question. We have another. So uh, mine is more of a general statement, I think. But on the topic of dialectics, where you have to have a reasonable assumption that the two share, I find in our current state in this country, there are just a, a trouble of agreeing on basic facts. Um, I find it hard to have these conversations 
on that premise if we cannot even reach the place where the conversation would be meaningful without that basic agreement. Thank you. And, and my first response is totally. My second response is I recall uh, working at a grocery store many moons ago. And uh, through the line uh, came uh, an older lady who paid with, for her groceries by use of the personal check. And, and when I tell you that this woman's handwriting was immaculate, I mean, it was, I was so jealous of this, and I expressed it to her in the moment. And I said, like, I'll never have handwriting like that. And she did not even look up at me, and she didn't miss a beat. She just said, in this thick Minnesota accent, that's because they stopped teaching the Palmer method. <laughs> we stopped teaching the method of asking questions that are directed at soliciting shared premises. We stopped teaching that in the Middle Ages because we got so damn smart. We, we neglected this art. That's part of the, and, but I think we do find that people who are dedicated and caring enough kind of come to this by way of shooting from the hip. I, I recall in the context, the last thing I'll say, because I love the, the remark, I recall in the context of seeing somebody talking about a discussion with a, with a close relative who was a dyed-in-the-wool QAnon fan, somebody who was just, they were on the QAnon train, and, and having this discussion, the person who, who was the not QAnon member of the, was so difficult because we had to spend so much time finding a shared point of agreement from which we could begin to work. And what they found is, at rock bottom, we had to go all the way back until we agreed that child abuse is morally wrong. Like, and there, that was rock bottom. And from there, we can start to make our cases. But you're absolutely right. It is, it is, a, it is a condition of, of intellectual impoverishment in which we find ourselves. I really believe that, that we have lost the art of figuring out how to talk to people respectfully in such a way that they know and we know that what I'm doing is trying to solicit premises from you. I'm trying to see what it is that your background beliefs are. So not so that we can agree to everything that follows, but so that we can meaningfully disagree. So that we don't waste time yelling at each other and shaking signs at each other uh, uh, when that energy really could be used in more productive ways. So agreed and, and a tear. What good questions we're getting. Yes. So you said like laws are finite and I gotta say um, with all laws, like I, it's, there are obviously good laws that I believe in, you know, like killing and stealing, but there are other laws that a, a vast majority of people could disagree on, you know, but we're ruled by uh, these laws, how, how are laws just if they're ruled by majority rule when majority rule isn't even always just itself? Like majority of people could, not saying it's true, but for the sake of argument, smoke cigarettes. You know, like while that's not necessarily good for you, it's also what the majority of the people choose to want. Yep. So how are laws all just? That puzzle is exactly the same and not, not a flippant rejoinder, and I'll explain myself, but that puzzle of, of how is it the case that since we, we have these laws that are so faulty and, and, and the majority can be so easily manipulated and we know these things, like how is it the case that the laws are just? That's the same thing as me holding up an acorn to you and going, how is this an oak tree? The answer is not yet. Not yet. The proper procedure of its unfolding of itself that is always already a self-destruction is what gets it to be the oak tree. And so that's a lot in, in a few words. And so let me just take another couple of sentences and explain myself. So in, the, in claiming that the end of the law is justice, that's not saying that the current condition of the law is justice. The current condition of the law relative to the future on this account, on this philosophical version of events, the current condition of the law is as bad as it could possibly be. And the adjustments that we make are for the sake of justice. Now, there's no guarantee that the adjustments that we make are going to be good ones. It may well be 10 steps forward, 9 steps back, or the reverse. We might be digging ourselves lower and lower. But the point of the idea of a teleological conception of law is to suggest that justice is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Justice is not necessarily imminently reflected in any law that's promulgated. If it were, then it would be impossible to reasonably object to any law. 
Then, then if it were, we, and we had people who took those positions over the course of history, but we with an eye to history know that there were certain acts that were passed that just weren't very good. They, 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 they were mis- I mean, you know, you can go back to the beginning of the nation and think about the Alien and Sedition Acts under the Adams administration. Like, whoa, <laughs> that was just the wrong move. I mean, we passed them. We had to walk that one back. And so the, the, the other thing that, that, that dialectic and taking this sort of two-sided look at things enables in us, one hopes over time, is a certain intellectual and moral patience with things. That we are not going to, we're never going to load the legal gun with the magic silver bullet. It's always going to be a case more of chipping away at the stone. Are you insinuating that we should take the form of the visitor in Theotetus in every argument ever to try and find a moral truth on everything? When uh, objectively, we are going to have biases and ultimately disagree. But since, as you said before, law is ultimately finite within the worst possible situation, what can we sort of, uh, I would say, observe from having these conversations that ultimately would lead to nothing as they obviously see in the sophist every time they try to describe it it leads to nothing so so a couple of things good and and he's referencing one of plato's works um uh plato's sophist so a couple of observations there without going too deep into the tall grass of that particular dialogue one is that that the good news is that that as i said 99.9 percent of the time we don't have to do this because because most of the time our habits are good our habits you know get us through the day Uh, when they don't Most of the time they don't, we can fall back on the law. Most of the time we can. We can fall back on the law and say that that, that we trust that in this situation the law takes care of us and the law does. It's in the situations that both of those fail that we're called upon to engage in this kind of thinking. Um, The other thing that it occurs to me to say is that if and when we are called upon to engage in some kind of a dialectical discourse, it's not the case... The other thing we want to keep eyes out, and again, you know, some, something that we talk about in, in my classes about the nature of philosophical discussion. The fact that the discussions about these things seem to keep coming around to the same starting points. The fact that the discussion about what happened to George Floyd seems to keep coming around to ideas about police authority and ideas about race, that we keep revisiting those same issues. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are always reinventing the wheel out of whole cloth. There's the possibility, and again, this gets to the thing about eschatology that I'm just not interested in planting a flag on today. There's the possibility that what seems from the bird's eye view to be a circle that's going round and round is in fact a spiral that's going upward. It is possible that, as Dr. King said, and I don't want to abuse this sentiment, but that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends toward justice. Again, he thought so because of his eschatology. It's not on you to agree with him necessarily, but the possibility is there that it is not simply mind-numbing circularity whereby we're, we're hitting the reset button entirely every time. Maybe it's the case that we're coming back to that same square, but now equipped with a greater insight. Uh, that, that's one of the things, and, and again, this, you know, this was, I'm sure, very muddled, but that was one of the things that I hoped was coming out here in our discussion of these things, that every time we come back to the, yeah, but we're at loggerheads with you know, my particular interests and, and the demands of, of the community as such, every time we came back to that insight, it was again and again with new equipment, new tools in the toolbox. And so we can keep working on the same thing, but refining it more and more. That is a possibility that's open. Jazz, I've got one question for you too. I've got a, an American lit class here. And one of the things that's characteristic about my academic discipline in the last generation is greater democratization of the reading list. So if we were having this class 40 years ago, we might be more limited, for whatever reason, to the white male authorship. To what extent has your academic discipline undergone reappraisal and revision the way we've seen it in Uh, other disciplines. For instance, my students will be reading uh, white, black, and brown authors, and I think that's good. That's an essential good. Uh, To what extent has your tradition uh, 
responded to some of these changes? Yeah, thank you. Um, and so as one might expect, uh, uh, the, the discipline of academic philosophy, the sort of thing that's done in colleges and universities, is, is not at all immune to the same sorts of things uh, that have been affecting other disciplines across the board. Uh, philosophy's in, uh, well, as every discipline is, it's in a bit of a unique situation in that given, given its age and given its point of origins, which, of course, any human endeavor, however highfalutin it holds itself to be, originated somewhere among some people. And so given its age and its origins, it is indisputable that the vast majority of the philosophy that's been written down and preserved was originally done by white men. One of the cool things about this dialectical methodology that I've been referencing is that if philosophers are who they say they are, then they had better be the first ones in line ready not just to listen to, but to participate in an interrogation of the premises that fired that sort of inheritance of those works of literature, of those voices who were allowed to be heard and not shut down. We have to be the first ones in, in the chow line, so to speak, ready to sort of do that interrogation. I, I am, I'm not ashamed to say that holds me over and above other people. It, philosophers are people too. And so you get a wide variety of attitudes toward that question. Some saying, you know, well, it just, it is what it is. Like, what are you going to do about it? This is a distraction. Let's go back. The other thing that's important to note about philosophy is, and, and, and this is something that is worth saying, when we're dealing with our subject matter in philosophy, our subject matter is not primarily biographical or social. It is conceptual. And so the hope is that regardless of one's linguistic background, one's ethnic background, one's geographical background, one's historical background, these are concepts, these are ideas of a certain kind that are made available to human beings as such. And so there is that underlying premise of the shared humanity of anybody that comes to this stuff. But at the same time, and at the same time, the acknowledgement that if there is a, a corpus of literature from underrepresented peoples that, is, that has existed for these thousands of years, as this other you know, canon, so-called canon, has, we ought to be open to it. We haven't found it yet. If it's there, we ought to be willing to sift through it. And if it's not, we ought to be ready and waiting for the interrogative efforts on behalf of those who wish to subject that line of thinking to the sort of criticism that comes from the standpoint of, as Beauvoir said, the other. Like, how long did we have to, and she's a great example of that, how long did we have to go, she wants to know in her introduction, uh, until we came to realize that, that throughout this whole history of philosophy, the man has represented both the positive and the neutral. That, 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 that it's always the case that the woman is the other. That, 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 that the, the, the woman is this thing that's like not the regular. That, that the non-white is, is not the regular after modern times. And so, again, it should be the discipline of philosophy that's first in line to interrogate these things. We don't do as ideal a job of that as we wish that we would. It's also the case that we're working with a body of subject matter that is indisputably what it is. And so dealing with what is, salvaging the good out of what is, and awaiting the good that is to come is always an exercise in intellectual flexibility that humbles every one of us. Thank you. We have time. Um, so bouncing off of that, something I was really thinking before is when you talked about moral reckoning um, compelled by hope and duty, um, how would you say over the years cultural perspectives and the, um, the browning of America, so to speak, the uh, more diverse voices that are entering into the discussion, how has that affected this sense of duty or what's right and my sense of hope well so I, I think the phrase that occurs to me there thank you for the question the phrase that occurs to me there is action and reaction action and reaction we will see an underrepresented group pop up with an articulation of its hopes of, of what it of what it believes to be the just best condition of the society in which we are all cooperating and then we will see a reaction on the part of those who are a member of a different group saying yeah but the right thing to do would be this but our duty is this and the shoe then gets put on the other foot. Then you've got the people who have been traditionally represented out in front that says, my hopes for the nation and the society are these. And there is the pushback. There is the reaction 
from those who have been upper, underrepresented to say, but the right thing to do would be this. And so we continue to see that action and reaction. Again, what I hope, what I hope to encourage is, to, is an openness to a way of thinking about this conflict that says we don't need to get rid of this conflict. The idea of, of, of reaching some state of affairs where we no longer contradict each other may not be the point. The point may be an elegant navigation of that action and reaction, hope against a sense of right and duty. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Well, then, let's show our presenter some appreciation for an hour of power. Well done. Chaz, thank you very much. And all of our attendees, thank you for coming. This was meaningful, and uh, I appreciate you attending. If you're in my Lit 220 class and you haven't signed uh, in with attendance, please do so. Otherwise, we have a one o'clock panel session, Transgender Today.